Imagine you're an interstellar traveler. What sorts of alien life might you find out there in the universe? It's interesting to speculate on how life might evolve in the depths of a planet covered by oceans, or the skies of a world with an atmosphere teeming with floating life. Perhaps, one day, humanity will be able to set out into the universe and document these unfamiliar worlds firsthand. This concept is explored in great scientific detail in The Teeming Universe, an interstellar field guide by speculative author and artist Christian Klein. The book, which I have a link to down below, explores how alien life might evolve on various types of planets much different from our own. So for this entry into the archive, we'll be joining a scientific vessel on a journey into the beyond, and we'll explore just some of the worlds that Klein covers in his field guide. Several million light years from Earth, the first fictional planet we're touching down on doesn't look like much. This is Planet Manir, a world of ice and rock with a diminished atmosphere and high levels of ultraviolet radiation. Stepping out onto the surface, it seems like there isn't any life here, but that's because to find life on Manir, you have to look under a microscope. That's right, the first alien life we found is a kind of bacteria. It might seem disappointing, and there will be much larger aliens to come later in the century, but even discovering microscopic life on an exoplanet would be a huge moment in science. And just because these life forms look like Earth microorganisms to the untrained eye, it doesn't mean they're the same. Called Manirophiles by the artist, he imagines their unique purplish-pink color helps them reflect excess radiation and because they contain hydrogen peroxide within various organelles instead of water, they don't freeze. While such a mixture would be deadly to Earth bacteria, Manirophiles are protected from the harsh effects by silicon in their molecular structure. So while the life on the desolate Manir may be tiny, it's exceptionally resilient. But the time has come to leave this exoplanet, and head to a world where life gets a little bigger. At first glance, our next planet, Ateria, appears far more Earth-like. With a protective atmosphere and liquid oceans, Ateria offers a much better opportunity to find complex alien life. And touching down on the surface, it's a beautiful foggy day. Out of the mist rise grand plant-like structures, and the air is filled with the buzzing of animals. Yet we'll find Ateria is much different from Earth in one critical way. It's seasons. On Earth, seasonal change happens gradually due to Earth's axial tilt, with most animals having numerous strategies to adapt to the predictable changes. But due to a past asteroid impact, Ateria has a wildly elliptical orbit, meaning it moves close to the Sun for some of its orbit and far out into the cold of space for the rest. This means the seasons on Ateria are truly extreme, and life on this planet has had to get creative. Beginning with plants, we might spot strungs, which possess a bright red tint to get the most out of the sun's slightly dimmer light. During winters when the environment cools, strungs' partially hollow bark retains insulating air, allowing for extra heat protection. But other organisms, like the fisher crane, the first animal we've encountered on our voyage, have a different strategy to survive the seasonal changes. They might look somewhat like insects, but fisher cranes are far larger, with a wingspan of 4 feet, or 1.2 meters. And to outsmart the cold, these creatures simply die after laying eggs, which a new generation emerges from when the temperatures rise again to start the cycle anew. Another insect-like creature, the tripper hog, has the more familiar strategy of hibernating during the long winter, with their thick shells camouflaging them and protecting them from harm. Another clever solution. Ateria is a fascinating and extreme world, but we must look to the horizon once again and see how much more incredible alien life can get. The next stop on our journey is the massive fictional planet called Torea. The brilliant blue of this planet comes from the fact that 99% of its surface is comprised of an incredible planet-wide ocean. And life in our own oceans can already be so alien, you can imagine what's under the waves of these endless waters. The region closest to the surface is called the Pelagic Zone, and contains entire ecosystems founded on towering colonies of kelp-like plants. Nicknamed Heaven Kelp, these plants can grow up to an astonishing 750 feet or 228 meters in length, almost like underwater trees. Among the leaves, aquatic life such as the fish-like Pelagonarians seek shelter and food. Some fish on Earth live in undersea forests of kelp or seaweed for similar reasons. 
Pelagonarians, or Pelags for short, are a highly diverse group that have evolved to fill all manner of underwater niches. The incredible diversity of the Pelags makes the oceans of Torea a teeming aquatic wilderness, much like the richest areas of Earth's oceans. The artist imagines that one species of Pelags, the Gallant Gulls, can even leave the water altogether as they've evolved powered flight. Due to their aquatic ancestry, however, they still need to occasionally dive back underwater to breathe. But the Pelags aren't the only life forms that lurk below the waves. Further down, in the twilight of the bathypelagic zone, you can find various translucent or bioluminescent species, feeding on floating pieces of organic matter or on each other. And it's here where the largest organisms in the ocean dwell, the Anum, the most gigantic creatures we've encountered on our journey so far. They're able to reach a staggering 250 feet, or 72 meters in length, due to the vastness of the planet's oceans, which the Anum navigate on an enormous transparent sail. Curiously, the Anum are comprised of vast colonies of jellyfish-like invertebrates, which work together as a single giant life form. And at the bottom of this planet-wide ocean, you can find the abyssopelagic zone, where ghostly, pale gray species swim through the dark. In the absence of sunlight, many lifeforms in the abyss survive off a chemical soup supplied by hydrothermal vents, an extreme form of survival that also occurs in our own oceans, proving life can take hold almost anywhere. And the next imaginary planet on our interstellar journey is no exception. At 64% of Earth's mass, Yulin is the smallest planet we've visited yet. Its gravity is therefore so low, it's on the very edge of the minimum for planetary habitability, which has had a fascinating effect on the planet's native life. Much of Yulin's surface is locked in permanent ice caps, as the low gravity has resulted in a thin atmosphere that retains little heat. While some forms of life venture into these frozen wastes, most of the planet's organisms live on the warmer equatorial tundra. Here, for the first time in our interstellar voyage, we can spot trees which are quite similar to those on Earth. Similar doesn't mean the same, however, and upon closer inspection of their leaves, you can spot some key differences. Due to a higher presence of blue visible light on Yulin, leaves have evolved to use not chlorophyll, but the yellow pigment xanothyll for photosynthesis. And above the yellow foliage, you can spot the magnificent Cleary, flying animals similar to birds or pterosaurs. These low-gravity flyers have wingspans of nearly 40 feet or 12 meters, which they use to soar on mountain thermals that help them achieve liftoff despite the thin atmosphere. After mating, Cleary build nests in the branches of Yulin's trees, raising their young in pairs like many species of birds. And their newborn babies are called Cleariots, which is one of my favorite details. Cleary typically feed on animals like the cobbleback trait, an aquatic creature that gets its name from a pattern of stone-colored markings that help camouflage it from predators gliding overhead. To lay their eggs, the cobbleback trait, like many freshwater earth fish, must make a trying voyage upstream to the frigid regions where predators are scarce. One creature that doesn't have to worry about predators, however, is the armored sisobi, low-gravity grazers that can grow up to 20 feet, or 6 meters in length. From the edge of the tundra to the continental deserts, you can find these shaggy giants, which move in great herds not unlike Earth bison. And as the sun sets on Yulin, many plants let off a brilliant glow to attract pollinating species. It's a dazzling display, but the time has come to continue our expedition. And the next imagined world is perhaps the most extreme so far. Borold is a planet that closely orbits a red dwarf star, only 20% the size of our sun and far cooler. Borold is also tidally locked, with one side of the planet perpetually facing the sun in an endless day and the other trapped in an endless night. Yet despite the harshness of Borold, there is life upon this rock. In the less extreme twilight region between the dark and light sections of the planet, you can find the Borold stars. The largest animals on this planet's surface, these creatures can grow up to 30 feet or 9 meters long. Since the gravity on this planet is almost three times that of Earth, these stars creep slowly across the ground, almost like giant terrestrial starfish. 
The real challenge for these stars, however, is food and water. Unable to hunt due to their top speed being 1 mile or 1.6 kilometers per hour, borrowed stars simply crawl over anything edible and crush it under their body. And when they find water, these unusual creatures can drink hundreds of gallons at a time. Borrowed stars aren't alone on this rock, however. There are also plants, just not plants as we know them. These are the Valayan Azure, which look like jagged, tall stones, but are actually cone-shaped photosynthetic life forms most analogous to Earth trees. Their design helps protect them from the planet's brutal winds, which are the result of the extreme temperature gradients produced by the planet's tidal lock. Our final boreal organism, however, can take advantage of these perpetual winds to achieve liftoff. You might not expect flying creatures on a world with such crushing gravity, but boreled kites are scavengers that let these currents carry them to their next meal. Unique? Certainly. But even more fantastical lifeforms might be waiting on the final stop of our journey. The last fictional planet we'll be visiting is also the largest of them all. A world somewhere between a terrestrial planet and a gas giant, Herkelion has a thick atmosphere divided into layered ecosystems, almost like an aerial ocean. And it is in this atmosphere where we'll find some of the most awe-inspiring life in all the cosmos. In the stratosphere, balloon-like animals float on sacks of internal hydrogen, steering themselves through the air on specialized fins. Many of these animals feed on green clouds of aerial foliage, groups of small floating plants held aloft by the wind which contribute to the high oxygen levels in Herkelion's atmosphere. And feeding on the herbivores are speldos, airborne predators which, despite being twice as long as a school bus, are quite agile. Speldos lack jaws, but their gaping mouths are filled with teeth, so to hunt they simply ram into their prey. But the speldos aren't the true titans of these skies. Oons are the largest animal we've found on our expedition, at over three times the size of a blue whale. Indeed, oons are more than just singular lifeforms, and incorporate dozens of symbiotic species into their bodies. Oon mites are among the most important, as they act like the colony's guardians. While normally docile, they become fierce protectors when the oon they call home is threatened. Sometimes, however, an oon passes away and falls through the atmosphere to Herkelion's surface, in a striking event known as an oonfall. Below the calmer upper atmosphere, the surface of Herkelion is a volcanic, stormy wasteland, in one of the most extreme regions glimpsed so far. Yet even here there is life, like the tiny Pragler worms, which you can spot illuminating the dark with their bioluminescent displays. These humble organisms prove, once and for all, that life can take advantage of even the most extreme scenarios. Although our journey through the cosmos is over for now, Christian Klein's book The Teeming Universe contains many more incredible speculative worlds and alien creatures, and I encourage you to check out the link to it below. I've also included a link in the description to Astro Vitae, a relatively new speculative biology magazine that you can read online for free. The Teeming Universe was recently featured there, and they've got a lot of other cool stuff too, so I wanted to spread the word to fans of the genre. And as always, thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this entry, please lend your support, and like, subscribe, and hit the notification icon to stay up to date on all things curious. See you in the next video.